So by the way, there's a big question of whether it's TSNE or TSNE. So I'm from the TSNE uh, part of the world. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm that, that's the way I'm going to say it. OK, so I'm Gal, and I'm doing my master's in Weizmann. Uh, I'm actually doing some more theoretical machine learning. So I do Python and deep learning for fun. Um, OK, and feel free to ask questions. So if, if we won't have time, I'll say I'll answer it in the end. OK, so just to start us off with a fun example, take a look at this random subset of emojis. And let's see if you can answer some questions. So where is 3 o'clock? Guys, you're supposed to be smart. OK, good. And how about a really happy smiley? OK, so this is slightly subjective. Some people think that that guy is angry or whatever. I think he's happy. Uh, OK, good. So it took you some time, right? And if it would be like four or five times as many as emojis, then it would be even harder. So this is just one cute example of how something very simple like uh, visualization can help also to like communicate data in a fun way. So here you can see that even though this was completely unsupervised, okay, all I'm using here is the visual similarity. Essentially, I'm getting kind of label information. Okay, you can see that there is like a huge area of uh, the clocks and a huge area of the smileys. Okay, right. So what I'm going to talk about today, there's going to be like 15, 20 minutes tops of theoretical foundations. Uh, there's going to be some math, so I hope you won't be too upset with me. Um, then I'll talk about uh, when you run it in practice, what are the good things you should look out for and give you some practical tips. Uh, and finally, I hope I'll have time to talk about it. I'll mention two pretty cool example cases, applications, which I think are like creative uses of something like this. Okay. OK, so everyone knows what visualization is, right? We've done it in Excel for like 20 years, 26 in my case. Um, OK, but what is the problem with uh, these types of visualizations that we know and love, like histograms or scatter plots? OK, so like I've written here, essentially every time I can only capture either one or two variables at a time. So imagine my data is like 1,000 or 2,000 dimensions, which today makes perfect sense, right? It's not that uncommon. Then I'll have to do like 2,000 squared scatter plots just to see how all the variables interact, OK? So essentially, the question that we're going to follow today is we're looking some, so for some good visualization methods that scale to high dimension, OK? I want to get either one or two maps that give me a good understanding of what my data looks like. OK, I just noticed now that he doesn't have an ear, so I'm sorry <laughs> for all the cat lovers out there. OK, so let's formulate the problem that we're going to talk about. So my example instances, my input, are x1 until xn. OK, think about like uh, n images from MNIST, just to, to get it simple. Uh, and these examples are in high dimension. OK, so each xi can be in like R1000, OK? And my goal is to convert every such example xi into an example yi that sits in a much lower dimension. OK, what do I mean by low dimension? Either 2 or 3D. Why 2 or 3? Yeah, because we're humans, and that's what most of us can grasp. Um, OK, and obviously, there's a million ways to do this, right? So what I will be looking for is a way that preserves as much of the structure that I had in the original dimensions in the lower dimensional embedding, OK? Does this, is it always possible to preserve all the structure? No, OK? Obviously, I'm losing tons of information when I'm doing the dimensionality reduction. So what I'll try is to lose the information that I can afford to lose, OK? That's supposed to make sense. Yeah. It will be clear in two slides, uh, but that's a good question. A good question is the one I have a slide for, as you, of course, know. OK, so a natural question at this point, which is usually what I get, then, OK, basically all you've told us is a problem of doing dimensionality reduction. And for that, we have 
PCA, right? A great algorithm for dimensionality reduction. I'm guessing most of you are familiar with it. Is that cool? Okay, PCA just essentially projects the data onto a lower dimensional subspace in a way that maximizes the variance. Hopefully, if you didn't know, that explanation <laughs> helped you. Okay, so before I talk about why PCA is bad, let's see an example. So what I've done here is I've took the digits from MNIST, okay, which you can see on the left if you don't remember. So every example sits in, um, in this case, it's 28 by 28 image, grayscale, which means 28 squared uh, in terms of dimension. I projected it onto its first two principal components, and then I plotted it here with uh, color coding for the labels. Okay, and what do you guys think? Is this a good visualization? Why? <laughs> Not because I said it's going to be a bad visualization. Great, okay, so just before we say it's very bad, we can see that it does some good things, right? You can see that it does manage to completely separate the zeros from the ones, right? The red left and the orange right. But everything in the middle is just really like jumbled up, okay? And in an actual real world scenario, I don't even have the color coding of the labels, right? I do this type of thing just when I want to understand how my data looks like when I don't have the labels. And in this case, you're correct that this is absolutely meaningless. Okay, so this is the problem that we're trying to fix. Um, okay, so why is PCA not what we want? So first of all, something to remember is that essentially it's, it's a linear projection uh, in the end. So if this transformation is not linear, then I will be incapable of expressing it using PCA. But really the more important thing in you might have to think about it a little and, and convince yourself later uh, that when you maximize the variance, which is the ob objective in PCA, really what you're doing is focusing on preserving the large distances. Okay, and by that I mean making sure that if two points were far apart in the original dimension, they will also be far apart in the embedding. Is that clear? Okay, and the question that I'm, I'm posing now is, is that really what we want when we're doing visualization? Okay, and I claim that the answer is no. Okay, and this is an observation that actually the more complex the data sets are, the more higher dimensional they are, actually the large distances are less indicative of the structure. Okay, so this is just an example of uh, the Swiss row. Okay, I just took it from like uh, scikit-learn or whatever. Uh, and you can see here that really the structure comes from, for example, the, the blue points being close together and the red points being close together, not so much the distance between the actual uh, layers, okay? I can make it like wider, the distances, w uh, the, the large distances would grow, but the structure would remain the same, okay? So basically what we've said until now is PCA focuses on the wrong type of task. Okay, so what would be the good type of task? Focusing on maintaining the small distances, the, the neighboring information. Okay, and that's what SNE does. So I'm going to talk about SNE. TSNE is just a, a small variant of it, so you don't need to worry about that for now. So SNE stands for Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, and as its name suggests, it tries to map the neighbors. Okay, it tries to make sure that if two points were neighboring, in the high dimension, they will also be neighbors in the embedding, okay? And basically what I've told you until now, that's the objective that we kind of want to have. And remember that we've said that you have to make some sacrifices, okay? You can't map all the distances. So let's try to make the sacrifices where, where we can allow it. Uh, okay, and this is gonna be like two minutes of, two, three minutes of the mathematical part, so you can listen if you want and do something else if you don't. Uh, so how does the algorithm actually work in practice? Maybe now I'll get to the board. Uh, it works? Okay. Okay, so basically for every point xi in the data set, I center a multivariate Gaussian around it, like so. Uh, and then for all the other points xj, I choose a value of pji, which is supposed to represent the structure, okay, following to your question by looking at the value of the density, okay? So if two points are far away, okay, this will be xi and xj will be somewhere over here, the value of the density is very low, okay? So I'm gonna have a value near zero. 
If, on the other hand, I take two points that are near, I'm going to have a value that is large. Okay, so just remember that there is an inverse relationship. Okay, two close points will have a high value in the density and otherwise. It's a good question. I don't want to, I'll talk about it a bit later, but uh, if you still have questions, we'll talk. Okay, so basically what I'm saying now is do this procedure that I've just described for every single point xi that you got in your data set. Okay, this will give me a conditional density, p, j conditioned on i, the expression on the top. Okay, that's what I've said. This mathematical stuff is just the centering of the Gaussian. Okay, and now what I'm saying is for every potential guess of, a, of an embedding y, I can do exactly the same thing, right? I can again calculate the distance between every two points, and this time I'm going to call it q, since it will be a different density. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now I'm asking you, if I were in an ideal case where I was able to maintain all the similarities, okay, my embedding is great, what would be the relationship between the induced q and my original p? Great, they will be exactly the same. Okay, so this introduces a very natural cost function for our algorithm, right? I want to find a mapping such that the Q that will be induced by it will be as close to P as possible. Okay, and this, the formulation is, okay, those edges are not supposed to be there. So this is just a formulation, okay? Uh, by taking the distance, because P and Q are both densities that I'm, taking the appropriate distance measure, in this case it's KL divergence, okay, and I'm just looking at the, at the, di at the distance between these two, and that is the, what I want to minimize, okay? The expression on the right is just opening up the expression for KL divergence. Ah, okay, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, okay, so how do I actually solve it in practice? I've, I've described the cost function, what do I do next? It appeared in for like one second, but I'm guessing you didn't read it. I want to minimize it, yeah, how do I do it? Stochastic, okay, it doesn't have to be stochastic, yeah, gradient descent, right? Okay, I just start from one initial guess, and then I keep making, choosing a better embedding that will minimize the cost function by going in the direction opposite to the gradient. Okay, all of you should know it from, like, deep learning or whatever. I minimize this expression here, I want to choose a yeah, I didn't write the differentiation just because it's, it's a long procedure, but the parameter is Q. It will be induced by my choice of Y1 until, okay. Cool. It's not convex and I will talk about it. Good, you're asking the right questions. Um, Okay, so just one final slide that I really want to drive the, p the point home of the fact that SNE focuses on the local structure. So let's take a better look at this expression on the right. So you can see that I've denoted the error term, okay, the log of P over Q. Essentially, every time I'm making a mistake in, in the structure, I'm going to pay something in this error term, right, because Q will not be identical to P. Okay. And you can see that this error term has a weight which is p, okay? So this weight is not symmetric, okay? And it comes from the fact that the KL divergence is not a symmetric uh, function, okay? p and q don't enter it in the same way. So essentially what I'm saying here is that the same error, okay, the same error in q to p will be, will be like penalized differently, okay? Higher values of p will be a, a mistake that is much more costlier to make. And when do I have high values of P, PJI? You remember from two slides ago? Great, okay, so essentially what it means that close points being mapped to far points, okay, this type of error will have PJI which is high and it's gonna pay a very high penalty. So that's the thing that this SNE objective is gonna try to avoid most. Okay, it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna, that I don't care about mapping far points. I still want to map far points correct, but I don't care as much about them. Okay, which is why I wrote SNE focuses on preserving the local structure. Okay, yeah. Does this mean that you will set a lot of errors where far points are brought too close together? 
Yes, and that's, that is the number one problem with SNE. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So T TSNE solves that, and that's why it's the popular version today. Uh, if I have time, I'll mention it. Cool. Um, okay, so just to see an example, so on the left is the same PCA from before, and on the right is the result of applying SNE on the first five digits of MNIST. Okay, and you can see that in terms of the improvement, it's like zero to one, right? It's almost a clear separation, except the fact, like you mentioned, that there isn't that significant separation between the actual clusters. Okay, but another nice thing that you can actually see, if you look at the ones, for example, um, even the orientation is preserved, okay? The ones that are facing this way are, are far apart from the ones that are facing that way. Okay, so this is like near, near perfect um, result. And this is TSNE, okay, with what I've mentioned, it, it does a better job of pushing them far apart. Um, and this is the stochastic uh, result of this uh, procedure. So you can see here, if I were, sorry that it keeps running. Uh, I, I always think about it two seconds later. Um, even if I were now to make the points black, okay, reduce, uh, discard the label information, you can really make so much sense from this visualization, okay? And it's completely unsupervised, yet you can look at this and know that there are like 10 or 11 natural clusters in this data set. So obviously it's like MNIST is today almost a toy example, but it's still, I think it's still uh, pretty impressive. Cool. Uh, questions? Okay, so we're done with the math. Good job. I have a question. Yeah. The most recent they limited in like data set number of points. In what way limited? Computationally? Okay, so actually computationally, um, T the fact TSNA became as famous as it is today and the number one go-to is because there's a very fast approximation method that essentially you pay very little in the error, but the, the algorithm runs in n log n. Uh, so n log n can scale perfectly well until like 10k examples. Right, so, so 10K, it's not that little. Something you can do for, for larger is just like either sample or like just choose randomly to plot some part of the data sets. And if you have 10 hours, then you can run the entire 70K digits of MNIST. Um, it, it's considered uh, pretty fast. Uh, and I've used it in like uh, production as well. No. That's a great question, okay? Uh, he asked if there's a function actually mapping me from X to Y, and the answer is no. Uh, TSNE, because the fact that I'm just, at every iteration, I'm just guessing, there's no like parametric function that transforms me t from X to Y. Um, in a way, I think it's, it's an advantage. Uh, okay, some people are nodding, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, there, I'm just, if you want to do parametric uh, estimation, then you have to assume a lot about the kind of structure that the mapping will have, and then you are limited in what you can express in a way. So TSNE can do good results on complex data sets because it assumes very little. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, so uh, it's another cat meme. Um, okay, so let's dig into the Python implementation. It's not as interesting, but I think it is useful to know in case you do want to like go home and do it. Uh, okay, so number of components is just either two or three D, right? The the embedded space dimension. Um, perplexity. Someone asked it here before. Remember that I said we center a Gaussian around it, so you can ask, how do I choose um, the right value for the for the Gaussian? So. Uh, it comes like in the form of choosing the perplexity value, so it's ha something that you as the user should do. Just keep in mind that it's supposed to denote the effective number of neighbors that every example has in the data set. So try to think about the data set that you're working with and choose a value that is appropriate. Honestly, I've gotten very good results without tweaking this parameter, and they also mention it in the article. So. Feel free to do it, but you don't have to. Uh, early exaggeration just means how close natural clusters will be in the embedded space. Okay, if you want a more spaced out visualization, then choose a higher value for this. 
Okay, learning rate, this uh, goes back to one guy's question. Um, KL divergence is not convex, so the objective function that I showed before is not convex. And we're solving it with a tool, gradient descent, that essentially means that the only guarantee I have is in terms of reaching a local minimum, right? Okay, and that can obviously very, be very problematic because I don't know how this loss manifold looks like. And if it has very bad local minimums, then I essentially have no guarantee over the quality of my mapping. Okay, so TSNE itself does some tr like, imp like optimization tricks to avoid this. Uh, momentum and like adding a random noise, people should be familiar with it. Uh, yeah, exactly, simulated annealing. Um, one thing that you can actually do to help it is to make sure that the learning rate is tweaked appropriately, just like in, uh, in neural networks. Uh, this is just the initialization of the embedding, what your first guess will be, either random or uh, PCA. Um, random state, just keep in mind, that because this is a stochastic procedure, every time you run it, you'll get a different map. So if you want to, like, if you got this one good map and you want to do it again, then make sure you, you control the seed of the pseudo-random generator just so you can reproduce the results. Standard in every method today in scikit-learn. Uh, and this is what I said before, the approximation method, it's called barnes hat I really recommend always using it. It's much faster and you don't pay a lot in terms of the error. Um, questions? Okay, so I actually ran into this algorithm like, I think it was six months ago, and um, it solved, it worked like out of the box, uh, really for like the, it took two minutes, I got amazing results on my images, I was like, whoa, great algorithm, and then I read the article and I was like, it's also a cool algorithm, it has some nice intuition behind it. Um, and then I, I try to understand, like, does it really solve the problem of dimensionality reduction? Does it answer every case? Uh, so I asked this question on uh, cross-validated, which is like the statistical brother of uh, Stack Overflow. And I got a lot of upvotes, and I was happy because I had reputation. Uh, but no one really answered my question, so I had to go do it on my own. Um, and this is actually, I think it's a nice lesson when, whenever you stumble upon a new algorithm, if you want to really understand it, try to understand the cases it doesn't solve. Okay, and how would you go about doing that? Okay, so one of the things that can be useful is try to take a very close look at the implicit and explicit assumptions that the algorithm makes. Okay, usually the writers of the paper have a very uh, strong inclination to kind of brush this off, okay, because they want to make it look like it, it's always uh, good. So, so you need to take a good look at it. Okay, and one of the main, really only assumption that TSNE makes is the local linearity assumption, okay? Essentially, remember when we calculate P, we, we use the Euclidean distances between every pair of two points, okay? And by doing this, essentially what we're saying is that locally, okay, when you zoom in to the, to the function enough, to the points enough, then they sit on a linear manifold. If it's gibberish to you, then don't worry. Um, okay, so let's look at the cases in which the local linearity assumption doesn't hold. Okay, so one really nice fail case is when you have very noisy data, okay? When you have very noisy data, then there is no nice manifold because you have a lot of, like, divergence, okay? And in this case, the solution is just to smooth the data, okay? Just apply PCA before you apply TSNE. And actually, if you look at the documentation in scikit-learn, they recommend doing it every time. Yeah, they say do PCA to 50 and then do, uh, and then do TSNE. 50 in terms of dimension. Yeah, do first 50 by with PS PCA and then do to two with TSNE. Okay. Yes, it's basically what I've said now. <laughs> uh, we can talk about it afterwards. Which one? 
Ah, for TSNE, yeah, you're, you're right, I forgot. Okay, and the other case, um, the other case, it's, it's a bit more uh, difficult. I don't want to get into it too much, but sometimes there can be data sets that are so complex that they have a very high intrinsic dimension, okay? You really, you can't do dimensionality reju reduction without losing too much of the information, okay? It's almost like a, a non-solvable problem. <coughs> so in this case, you kind of have to make your data set simpler. Uh, and that's something that you can do very well today with autoencoders, okay? Just choose a code length, which is the intrinsic dimension that you want, something that will be simple enough for TSNE to handle. Pass the data before to the autoencoder, then do TSNE. Uh, I didn't have to do it, so I think it's like pretty crazy cases, but keep this in mind. Uh, okay, so just final tips for this part. Uh, choose the right perplexity value, I said it, uh, even though it's not that critical, but okay. Uh, remember that it's a, it's a stochastic procedure, okay? So if you're doing deployment, don't just put out one map because it might be the one that is like the worst. J at least check the, the value of the cost function. Uh, make sure you do interpret the map of TSNE with some caution, okay? Because you can get some nice looking patterns even in just random, randomly generated data. So make sure you don't automatically go like, wow, amazing, I have so much structure in my data and it's actually just gibberish. Uh, and remember the, the fail cases, okay, which I've talked about. Did you see the, the results, the error, the test time? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. I, I actually got good maps every time, so I didn't have to do it. I, I, I did it on images so I could visualize the results. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the two example applications. The first one is very straightforward, but very visually appealing. And this is actually how I got to TSNE in the first place. Uh, I was required to, like, someone told me, do this. And then I was like, I don't know how to do it. I did PCA and the results were crap. Um, okay, so basically what we've done here is, uh, this is the work of Karpati. Uh, he took images. In this case, it's images from uh, ImageNet, but it doesn't have to be. He passed them through a pre-trained network, okay? He took the final layer as the deep features, okay? And if you don't know, then the final layer of the neural network, if it's trained properly, it's supposed to have a lot of like semantic information, okay? So if I take two butterflies, they are supposed to be similar in those representations, okay? The R4096 vectors are supposed to be fairly close to each other. So this is a natural case for TSNE, okay? I wanna make sure that if two examples were close in the high dimension, they will still be close in the low dimension. Uh, and, then I and then he snapped the results to this uh, nice looking regular grid. And imagine that you're like a company doing some sort of image retrieval or a search engine for images, organizing the results in such a way for the user. This, is, this goes back to the smiley example. I think it has a lot of, uh, stuff to gain, okay? It's very easier to find what you want in this example, okay? I used it, uh, I work uh, also at Celebrite, uh, which is like a digital uh, forensics company, and basically we have like millions of images and the, the investigator, the guy from the police, he wants to find like something suspicious and this is useful to take a look at the images of a single person and really understand his hobbies and what he's into and if he has like uh, nudity or stuff like that. You can see it in, you can look at it in five seconds and get a really good understanding of what that person looks like, what his hobbies are. Uh, okay, the second application um, is also related to deep learning. Um, okay, so I'm working uh, in Weizmann on a project that is uh, biology related. I'm using uh, deep learning to predict glucose values. And there I'm using TSNE quite a lot. Um, so one thing I'm doing, for example, is I wanna try to understand if something, some attribute, okay, like gender, is my network, the one that I've trained, is it using this information or not? Okay, it goes back to the question of interpretability, which she keeps saying uh, neural networks are bad because they're not interpretable. So there are things that you can do. Uh, so for example, one thing that I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking like 1,000 males and 1,000 females, passing them through the network, taking one of the features from one of the layers, plotting them on TSNE, and I'm looking at whether uh, there appear two natural clusters. 
Okay, if two natural clusters appear, essentially I know that TSNE, that my algorithm, sorry, that my network, not TSNE, uses this gender information, it encodes it in the representation. Okay, but I, I don't want to talk about that because it's fairly straightforward and uh, nothing special about it. And nicer work is something called meta SNE. So what I've said now is do TSNE on the representations. What meta SNE does is goes one level of abstraction higher. Abstract, uh, I don't know how to say it. Abstraction. Um, okay, and essentially do TSNE on the space of representations. Okay, and if that doesn't make sense, then think about uh, one neural network. Okay, it has like 10, 20, 120 layers. Every layer is a different representation of my original data. Okay, what I can do is I can try to understand how two representations are similar or dissimilar. Okay, it will give me an idea of what's going on inside the network. Uh, and another good reason to do it is that you can use this to answer the question, suppose I have two models, that they achieve similar results, okay? The losses are similar, the accuracy is similar. I can use this to figure out if on the inside they're also doing similar things when they're doing their prediction, okay? Which I think is, is pretty important. Um, Yeah, there is some, it's kind of a statistic that I build from this layer. It, it's a bit, uh, you can read it in the blog. Uh, yeah, yeah, I put the link. Uh, it, I didn't make it up, yeah, it's some guy made it up. Um, okay, so here you can see on the right the, the example. So this is like uh, a couple of different neural networks trained on MNIST and actually it the groupings, so I forgot to put the legend, but the yellows are, um, I think, sigmoid layers, and the, the pink are convnets layer, conv layer, and the red are uh, relus. Okay, so essentially it means that every different like, type of activation or, or uh, layer makes the data look in a different ma manner. Uh, I'm sorry it's not uh, clear enough, but you should read the blog. It goes into great detail about it. Uh, it's my last slide, so I managed to be on time. Um, if you have any questions, yeah. Yeah, someone clapped outside. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>